Correct. Um, so in coming up with this talk, I thought it would best be represented, but what do geotechnical engineers need to know about pipelines, materials, and growth welds when looking at these assets? And so I'd just like to give a quick thank you for, for inviting Doug for me to talk to you all today. While I'm not a SME in welding nor weld integrity, I do have a PhD in materials engineering and 15 years of experience in pipeline integrity. So I am the overly keen engine nerd talking to you while still on mat leave. So please excuse the mum brain. Today I'll keep the content high level to give hopefully all of you a better understanding of the importance of growth welds and the interaction with geohazards. The goal here today is not to make you SMEs or experts, but to create some shared language for future collaboration with pipeline integrity engineers when working on fitness for service issues. And if anybody has questions that don't get answered today, feel free to reach out to me um, via email um, and I can get back to you when I get it from MacLeave or uh, through LinkedIn. So back in February, 2023, the CER, which is the Canadian Energy Regulator, put together a growth world workshop and Yang Yi Wang presented a high level summary of the recommendations for mitigation of low strain growth welds at failures. And he used this uh, visual representation of the problem and I have here repurposed it for our talk today. And so as geotechnical engineers, you uh, and studying slopes and movements, you're looking at the demand side of what does the pipeline need to withstand in this environment, both from a subsidence perspective, as well as from a geohazard perspective. And to keep the pipeline in, you guessed it, operation. But as an integrity engineer, we focus more on the capacity side of the equation on the left-hand side, welding, materials, operations, integrity anomalies, which is more of my expertise. So if what I want to try to get to all, of, if you remember one thing from the talk today, it's that although pipelines are structurally simple, a cylinder is not a, they are not simple. Take these, pesky growth wells that have been causing issues over the, with the increased number of failures in the last 10 to 15 years. Growth welds are there these discontinuities that join one stick of pipe to the next stick of pipe. They occur at wall thickness changes. They occur at variations in pipe grade. They occur with the presence of integrity features, cracks, deformations, corrosion. They experience different, each growth weld can experience a different percentage of stress based on the hydraulic profile, as well as they can see different operating pressures and so differences in cyclic loading at those locations and so on and so on. A pipe is not a pipe is not a pipe. Each pipeline has its own characteristics. So be sure to seek to understand the capacity side of this equation just as much as the demand side. So let's briefly review both materials and welding in this presentation. So, hey, steel, isn't steel just steel? No, not at all. Steel is like soil. It's complex, has many subtle variations, which changes the way that it, it interacts. Pipeline steel is categorized as micro steel. And these alloying elements are used to contribute to a whole bunch of different factors, such as weldability, fancy term for the ability to describe how successful it can be welded to itself, improved mechanical properties, toughness, and hey, even corrosion resistance. Today, we aren't gonna get into the specifics. That's a four-year engineering degree. Just know that steel is made of many different elements and the amount of those elements changes in which is the steel behave. In fact, the composition of these elements have even changed over time based on steel making practices. Now, for the material science perspective, because I couldn't resist, there, this is the holy grail of materials engineering, which is, the structure, property, processing, performance relationship. It's not only what is in it, but how it is processed will contribute to its structure that eventually dictates the performance. These are all interrelated. There is no one-to-one -one relationships. So as processing methods of pipelines have changed over time, just like you know aging does to us, and we get better and smarter and faster, even with how we're putting together the Zoom call today, you know, to meet greater demand, so have steel making practices. And so therefore, so have their properties. We've now been able to manufacture higher and higher grades of steel to have stronger and stronger um, pipes. But with that comes complexity, 
which we'll get to a bit later, about the growth welds. So every piece of pipe has this beautiful record, because IML records go. Loves is the material test record, the MTR. And this captures the composition, you know, its essential fingerprint, as well as the mechanical properties of each heat. Now, along, let's say, a 100-kilometer pipeline, there could be hundreds, if not thousands, of heats of pipes that have been used in that, in the construction of that asset. So we need to keep this in mind when we're evaluating pipeline materials. Now, just a quick refresher, as I'm sure this audience is more than familiar with the age-old stress-strain engineering plot, but just so that we're using all the common language, there's a few key properties that we need to remember. Yield, stress, is the ability of the material to deform elastically. Once it goes past this point, you're now into the plastic deformation zone. And ultimately, ultimate tensile strength is the point at which there is no return. Further moving on in with strain, AKA a landslide moving, brings you closer and closer to the road to failure. And we all do not want our assets failing. We're looking to keep our, our pipelines and our assets in this elastic region so that we don't have any plastic long-term um, deformations um, we can this is a where we want to be for fitness for service okay and the toughness is is represented by the end here of the curve and against my better judgment i have not talked about uh the hardness which can be a correlated factor for strength of materials but now how does this relate to pipeline steels the ratio of the yield strength and the ultimate tensile strength is is has changed over time so the closer it is to one, meaning that these two points happen more concurrently, that means that there's less time at the same strain rate to respond to the source causing the strain, which could be very problematic when dealing with um, changes in, in pipeline stresses. And modern pipeline steels, with their increased mechanical properties, have changed the shape of this engineering stress strain curve such that the ratio of Y over T, yield stress to ultimate tensile strength, have become much, much larger, meaning that it has reduced strain capacity after yield and can also be referred to as low strain hardening. And this makes mismatch conditions at yield much, much less favorable. Now remember, we're in the real world here. And yes, there is a given yield strength. It's a value, it's on the MTR, it must be what it is. However, that value on that MTR from one heat to another, they're not the same number. There's a distribution of yield strength and pipe properties within each grade of pipe. And the grade that's given is actually the lower bound of the distribution as shown here to make sure that we're operating with some safety factors. So let's recap quickly. Between one joint to another, we can have different, com different chemical compositions, we can have different mechanical processing, AKA of one vintage of pipe to another. We can have, I know in one pipeline in Alberta here that they alternated between seamless pipe from one mill and then seamless pipe in another mill. So it can happen with construction practices, different vintages, as well as now these range of mechanical properties. Hey, guess what? Some more stuff has changed with time. Modern pipelines, the mills have been able to certify a specific joint of pipe to multiple grades as, hey, it meets the minimum, it meets all the requirements. But what about the maximum? Sounds like a good deal, eh? Getting stronger pipe, better than what you for paid for? That's an awesome deal. Hold that thought, is it really? So let's quickly talk about welding. There's three main areas of what you can consider a weld. You can have your base metal, you can have your weld metal. That's deposited by various different processes with multiple passes. And if this audience were welding engineers, the talking about the sequencing and the electrode types and the heat inputs and the normalizing temperatures, well, that would be probably for the rest of the day. And then, but we'll skip that. And then we have the heat affected zone, termed the has. And this is the area that the pipe has been changed by heat from the welding processes kind of like maybe we're all dreaming of uh, for a vacation into Hawaii. We'd like to relax. So, and there's many multiple different zones within the has, fusion lines, melting lines, grain growth, and yield zones. 
words such as subcritical or intercritical or coarse grain even may be used. These subzones describe how the microstructure of the heat affected area has changed with the input of the weld metal. Heat, input, cooling, composition all have different impact on diffusion of the elements, those micro alling elements in the crystalline structure and they change how the phase behavior transforms and the rates of those changes. Now, just so that we can get real nerdy, I want to show you this actual physical diagram within the region to give you an appreciation of the changes to the metal structure. So in the unaffected base metal, our grain structure may look like this. However, hey, look, if we're looking at the heat affected zone, there's a real range in how the crystal the crystalline structure has changed and the phases that it comes and this over here is the albeit sexy uh, phase diagram of low carbon steel and i will not get into details of it today but know that the welding process changes from where from one phase to another and then even the way that it changes and the rate that it changes changes what the structure is happening inside that heat affected zone area so Welding, heat affected zone, pipe, K, Nikki, I got it. No, nope, there's some more. So you need to think about girth welds in terms of is the plate, uh, the, the base metal, the pipe, compared to the weld metal. Are they the same tensile strength or are they different? If And what we want to look at here is are, are pipe to growth well, are they undermatched or overmatched? And each can cause different problems for susceptibility of failure in pipelines. So when the pipe is much greater than the weld, you have growth weld undermatching. Okay, that doesn't sound good. When you have undermatched wells, what that means is that now that is your weakest link on the pipeline, that the weld. And so if you were to go through Recall our understanding for stress strain curve, an undermatched growth weld causes a weak link in the pipeline. Think relatively of the dimensions of a growth weld compared to a jointed pipe. The pipe is infinitely larger than that growth weld, meaning that global strains that can be distributed within the pipe body with uniform properties compared to these growth welds that are much, much smaller. So an events of stress may cause deformation, more deformation in that localized area of the growth well compared to the larger pipe itself. Alternatively, welds can also be overmatched, meaning when the weld metal itself is much, much stronger than the pipe metal. And overmatching welds also can concentrate strain into the softened has regions if flaws are close to the heat affected zone, translating to lower fracture resistance meaning it has less ductility to even take out that strain. So when you look at welding, our, here on the far left-hand side is a visual representation of both that plate and that weld. And typically the has region, the heat affected zone, has been the strongest part within the pipe. However, with the new modern pipeline steels, you can see with the quench and tempered and the thermomechanical process type steels, the has region, the heat affected zone, actually showcases a reduced amount of strength because, hey, it just went through a beautiful vacation uh, being welded together and it's made some new friends and now it's all relaxed. And so that relaxing causes issues because now you have an even a smaller region for strain to accumulate and cause failure. So just a quick overview, if anybody gets one thing from today's talk is a pipe is not a pipe is not a pipe. Each pipeline has its own characteristics, so be sure to seek to understand the capacity side of the equation as well as the demand. And special attention should be paid to areas of strain across growth wells, as layers of protection against failure are more challenging to manage due to the potential short time frame to detect these issues, the re potential reduced capacity to withstand strain at the growth wells, as well as the technology available from an integrity standpoint to detect if any of these things are happening. Therefore, I encourage each of you to be collaborative with your integrity engineers for growth welds that are identified uh, under modern, of modern day steels circa 1980s and onwards to consider the has softening, undermatching, and reduced strain. Because what we really don't wanna do is have 
something that seems innocuous from a geotech standpoint to go through the next layer to be at a place where you have a pre-existing flaw in a pipeline caused by pipeline construction practices and under normal circumstances wouldn't be any problem and unable to be detected by tools to then lead to a, uh, oh shit, now we're in trouble event. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Doug. So that's some great background on undermatch welds. And Nikki basically just summarized about five hours of technical talks at the CR uh, presentation we had on February 15th. And I'm gonna give you almost in the entirety my address to the CER, which is on landslide hazard management and the has zone perspective of undermatched uh, welds. So I guess I'm a middle-aged engineer. Uh, everyone probably seen me on LinkedIn or wondering what's this guy up to. But I worked in consulting for, I would say, seven years before transitioning to the pipeline industry, where I've been working with some great people such as Nikki and other collaborators for almost 20 years now. And really enjoying myself. And I'll make another point before we start here. If you look at the disclaimer there, I have a lot of opinions. They may not be feminist, so just be mindful of that, okay? So the outline of this part of the talk is going to give a little bit of background, landslides 101, talk about ground and pipe monitoring, talk about the failures a little bit more, uh, building on what Nikki said, a little bit of IMU, talk about some new axial strain tools, and then I'm going to try to predict the future for you. So, in the U.S. in 2019, FIMSA put out a document saying, hey, you better worry about landslides. They may be a problem. And then in 2022, they re-upped that by reissuing the document. Now, why'd they do that? Because there was uh, 17 incidents in between there. Okay, then the National Energy Board, kind of specific to that issue, or I say, should say the Canadian Energy Regulator, I'll slip up, shows my age, um, issued a similar warning, specifically about tensile failures in HAZ zones. And I'll point this text out. While no instance associated with this type of failure have been reported in Canada, the CER is of the view that these could happen. Fair enough. Well, I'm going to explain today why, as Canadians, we should be slightly less worried than our American friends. So let's look at landslide susceptibility maps. Here's the Appalachians in the U.S. And here's the Western Canadian sedimentary basin that we're all familiar with. And within that, there's the Alberta landslide party triangle. So what I've done is I've taken two cross sections of the same length through the Appalachians and uh, our operating area in the Alberta landslide party triangle. And what we get is um, when you look at the Appalachians, there's way more hills and slopes and micro, micro topography. And then we look at the Grand Prairie Grand Cache area and we get, we get like basically you're, you're going across terrain, you're coming up to a major valley or meltwater channel, you're going straight down it, across it and straight back up. So this sort of creates a different situation. And the Appalachians, I should also mention, in the great words of Pete Barlow of BGC, yeah, all the houses are built either at the top of the slopes or the bottom of the slopes. Pipelines have to go on the slopes. And unfortunately, most of those slopes are moving. So let's just compare them, just for craps and giggles. So if we look at a pipeline segment, you and the Appalachians, the size of landslides can be anywhere from 10 to 100 meters. We're in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, it's 10 to up to four and a half kilometers based on my experience. The frequency is what you really got to pay attention to. You can have up to have 10 landslides per kilometer in the uh, Appalachians, where if you go to uh, Saskatchewan, we count them per province. Okay, fair enough. Now, because of that micro topography I did, side sloping is, two, is over two thirds of the US uh, pipelines, whereas in Canada, it's well less than one third. And then tie into that, when you have sort of micro topography, you're not doing a lot of HCDs. Where in Canada, with these macro valleys, massive ones, it's a common practice now, just the HCD the entire thing. So you, you most of the times get hazard avoidance. 
landslide velocities, let's just say they're similar. All right, so based on this, I'm going to sort of just throw it out to you that Canada is about 200 times less vulnerable to tensile failures than the US. That's based on, if you look at the chart, the landslide frequency, the occurrence of side sloping, the prevalence of HGDs, landslide velocity is about the same. And the other thing I'll mention is that from a geohazard management point of view, um, just the fact that FIMSA only realized sort of landslides were a big issue in 2019, I'll make a point that programs in Canada tend to be more mature. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll say, though, this number is trending down rapidly. I was recently at a meeting at the U.S. and uh, about this geohazard management, and there was a lot of talent in that room. So and if you don't, if you want to challenge, I mean, it's fair enough, but U.S. will have about five failures a year, let's just say. Canada, it's a fairly minimal number. So then let's go and look at a little bit more in detail about why and where we're at the state of the industry. We'll go to Dewar's landslide classification interaction system, and we'll look at what mostly we're concerned about, which is interacting parallel, oblique, and perpendicular landslides. And remember I said that parallel is most of what we deal with in Canada, where perpendicular oblique is most of what we deal with in the US. So that's typically where you'll get a failure in a parallel situation. This is where you get tension created in, in the other scenarios and in the parallel at the top of the slope. So we went out and did a little bit of a study and we looked at 85 sites with 159 slope polygons and 290 pipeline segments within that. And this is for a Canadian data set of a large operator. You can see that we have 84 pipeline segments acting parallel, 12 oblique, zero perpendicular. Now, that's not to say we don't have any perpendicular interactions. We've just mitigated most of them. So people go, well, why do you have pipelines in landslides? Well, hate to say it, but of course we want to avoid landslides. That's the number one mission. But sometimes you don't have a choice. This is the Beaten River Valley. And that is the landslide map of the Beaten River Valley, basically. I'm, I'm being a little dramatic. Those three polygons may not be landslides, if you can see them. So if you can't avoid the landslide, and let's say you, you can't go with an HCD because of various issues, well, then you try to avoid active landslides. And if you can't do that, then unfortunately, you have to route them through slower moving landslides, okay? Not optimal. And, you know, once again, for those that are the non-geotechs on the call, this is the holy grail, is complete hazard avoidance rather than risk control measures, okay, via e HDD. So now let's look at Dewar's scale of landslide movement, okay? I just want to, you know, there's some mechanical engineers on the call, so I'll explain it this way, is um, we've got inactive landslides, extremely slow moving, and then anything above very slow moving. And... For the next diagram, I've labeled them as such, okay? And to be inclusive of our American friends, I'm basically saying below an inch a year and above an inch a year. Okay, so look at this recent modern pipeline routing. These are areas where there's possibly dormant landslides, but there's no evidence of activity. This is less than an inch a year, and this is greater than an inch a year. And of course, we've, we've avoided any movement using this HCD, which I've shown in green. So let's go to the Cruden and Varnes landslide classification system. And with conventional pipeline segments, strain release in that, conventional pipelines may be remain fit for service below this velocity. And more ideally below this velocity, as pointed out, I think Mike Porter had a BGC had a great little paper on this using Markov chains. It's in the references, recommend reading it. But I'll remind people that velocity is not, it's, it's, it's your total displacement that's more critical, obviously, in a soil to pipeline interaction. Now, this is my favorite people are stupid slide until I realized that they weren't actually that stupid. You can see there's a bump sign on the highway there. But this proves a very uh, good point that landslides can behave badly. There was just some minor bumps in the road. They put the sign out, then things took off. What would happen if you had a pipeline in there? So I'm just, I'm just showing this image to point this out later on. And then, of course, you can get to the ultimate where 
you know, I, I tell people, oh, I've got all this pipe monitoring stuff and it's so great. But, you know, you can get into infrastructure Armageddon, where in this case you had a, a rock slide that occurred several kilometers above a pipeline. The mass broke up, got into a valley and became a debris flow and just wiped out the pipeline. And that's the actual blast radius. This is only a 12 inch line and for scale, there's two large excavators there. So just want to caution everyone. What I talk about about managing hazards today is, is about a certain subset of geohazards, not everything. So let's look at ground monitoring and I'm, and, and I'm not going to read this out, but many of you are well familiar with this and your geotechnical engineers. But I want to point out what's changed, at least over my career, the most dramatically, which is the introduction of LIDAR. It really makes good good show for uh, showing vice presidents, uh, uh, you know, situ evolving situations and, uh, you know, getting the funding to actually mitigate them. Well, in this case, clearly we have a landslide that's evolving and interacting with two pipelines as shown in LIDAR. Now, but I want to caution you about ground monitoring. For all the goodness and, uh, and greatness we've had, how much does it give you towards a true pipeline fitness or service determination? Okay, so then let's go and look at pipe monitoring. So we can do stuff on the ground where we can do locates or, uh, I won't talk about it today in much detail, but electromagnetic tomography. We can actually physically attach things to the pipeline to measure strain. Or what I like to focus on is the inline inspection tools, which are which which have really evolved rapidly over the last couple of years. And I'm going to talk about internal measurement units and axial strain tools. So next, we'll look at doer scale of information. We go from oblivious, you know, all the way through to when we actually measure things. And I want to show you the state of the art currently right now in the pipeline industry. For bending, we're there. For compression we're almost there. And for tension, we're lagging behind. And interestingly enough, I did what's called the DEA, or a Daxon element model, to verify this, as you can see here. So there is compression and bending. And unfortunately, tension is lagging behind a bit. So anyways, this model is still in development. A couple of universities have expressed some interest. So. Let's now look at compressive failures as opposed to the tensile failures and the has zones, which Nikki was detailing the vulnerability about previously. Okay, so we've got different limits, whether you're CSA or PRC, PRCI, but when a pipe starts bending and walking over itself, you know, some say a denaral validity starts it on failure, and some say that's the start of the wrinkle. Okay, this will be an important point later, and usually this happens at the zone of compression parallel. And if anyone's curious about looking at an example of this, because we've, we've managed to avoid these quite well in the pipeline industry and learn from them, the 16 tan failure would be an example. And let me tell you, it's a lot more subtle than you think, but when you can visually see it, like you can see the buckle in this pipeline, there's no way it could survive. Now, this is an example of a tensile failure. Now, this is a vintage girth weld, but same scenario where it just pulls apart dramatically. So let's talk about compressive versus tensile failure in managing them in a program. Compressive comes slower with some foreshadowing. Tensile is sudden. No direct indications using the technology that we've got nowadays. Pipe geometry is absolutely critical to compressive failures. With tensile failures, it's more about the pipe defects, in particular with modern steels, the hazards. Okay, compressive failures, you're going to see a wrinkle, a kink, or a buckle appear prior to the failure. At or near the peak strain, eh? Whereas in tensile, maybe you might see some CSCC, but you also have to have an environment and a coating condition to let that happen. So you can't use that. But okay, for compressive, I want to warn you. Waiting for a wrinkle is not a management strategy because I've previously pointed out landslides behave badly. For tensile, we're getting there and you can calculate elongation strains, but there's a technology coming online to measure this, but it's not currently widely industry adopted. So let's talk about pipe shape and pipe shape ch changes. If you, if you Google me up, I spend a lot of time on this. So no one ever said that construction never introduced a bending strain, eh? Okay, I don't know what Terrio et al. were doing in their spare time, but they looked at 4,600 features and greater than 90% of them in the Appalachian area were construction related, okay? 
The lazier people, Dewar et al., looked at 177, and this is just in published stuff. I, there's a lot more information out here, but only 2% were imparted due to landslides. And that, that number's about right, based on probably about the same as Cario et al., but I just haven't published it yet. So what do we do when we look at ILI? Well, basically what we're doing is we're looking at the position of the pipe in space. Then from that, we get the azimuth and pitch. You take the derivative of that and you get, they call it horizontal, vertical, and total strains, which is really a measure of the curvature of the pipe. Okay, fair enough. So we analyze this data uh, as part of our geohazard management program. And I'm showing you right now, stuff is hitting the fan. Okay, absolutely. But if we combine this with a caliper tool, which can detect those wrinkles and or buckles or changes in shape of the, uh, changes in the wall shape of the pipe, well, we're pretty good because we got the bending, we got the compression, and we got any changes in shape. And that's how we uh, detected this very serious scenario where a pipe is being thrust up at the toe of a translational landslide. And it was actually just on the precipice of failure. But the problem is, if you're using ILI IMU and you want to find segments of imparted tension on a pipe, they're quite common, but rarely seen. And the, when you do see them, what it is is a loss of curvature in the pipe as it straightens out under tension. They're, they're quite common, but can't be differentiated with ILI IMU. So what you need to do is you need to have a topographic experience uh, a feature for it to express itself. Like here, we've got a sag bend. And if you look at the sag bend, the pipe is actually getting pulled straighter over time. And actually, we dug that up. And the moment we relieved the, the confining uh, stresses from the, the soils, the pipe picked up eight inches. Fair enough. Now, I hate to tell a lot of people, but if you think, for instance, our technology is the point where we could actually measure the stretch in a pipeline, you can't. And I've, I've discussed this over with many of the industry SMEs and ILIMU. And based on the technology, you probably never, ever will be. So we got to find an alternate way of doing this. Now, before I go on, I'll, I'll mention that my buddies over at CRES, uh, Bailing Lu, Yong Yi Wang, et cetera, do have a method, though for calculation, uh, calculating elongation strains based on your typical Appalachian type loadings using very simple techniques. So I'll, I'll direct you to that if you're more curious. So what we do when we're looking at ILI IMU is, at least in my program, is you, you, you screen the strains based on the uh, strain or curvature values that are reported. And I, I change it based on the uh, diameter of the pipelines, because obviously larger diameter pipelines are much stiffer, and landslides will tend to impart uh, smaller strains over longer distances on them in most cases. Fair enough. But you'll notice at the bottom that I treat higher grade pipes with the most conservative. Now, the criteria is not just about this. It's also got these conditions in it, which are actually more critical. Don't worry, I'm not going to read this out to you. That would be presentation heck. So what I'm going to do instead is summarize. So if a bending strain changes shape, intersects a landslide, intersects an anomaly, EX, a wrinkle, or is weird and unexplained. I mean, we're still learning, right? So fair enough. So if it's that, you need to dig deeper. So where we go with tension now is I think where the future is, is going to be the axial strain tool technologies. Here's an example of a feature which is completely innocuous on ILI IMU, but yeah. So that was so violent that my knee jerked up when I, while I was videoing it. Okay, fair enough. If you put the hoop stress back on the pipeline, that pipeline was one third of the way or about one half the way to a tensile failure. This pipeline obviously had no product in it or no pressure on it. That would not work out well if we did this. Okay, so yeah, just an example. And like I said, on the ILI IMU, there's zero signs of this. Okay, that's where the axial strain technology comes in. In, in current configurations, what we have is eight circumferential probes at equal equidistant, I should say, 45 degree increments. And it measures strain using something called the Valeri effect. Now, if you want to do more uh, research on this, there's lots of references 
in the presentation. But basically what it does is it measures the electromagnetic permeability. So as the permeability increases, that's when the pipe's under more tension. When it decreases, that's when it's under more compression. Okay, but the, the interesting thing is there's no practical comparable technology. As an example, we pass through magnetic flux leakage tools, which determine the wall thickness of pipelines. We can verify it in the field by using ultrasonic and some other technologies. Or yeah, I guess you could drill a hole in the pipeline too, but I wouldn't recommend that, especially when it's operating. Um, okay, fair enough. But you can't compare anything to the axial strain tool, so there's no way to verify it in ditch, which is something pretty critical when we're doing uh, pipeline integrity. The best you can do is if you've got multiple runs and you've got strain gauges, you may be able to do some sort of comparison there. And I know others are working on that right now. And there may be, hopefully there's something coming out in the literature soon. So what does the axle strain data look like? So what we get is we get obviously the chainage uh, along the pipeline. And then we get in micro strains. So one millionth of a strain, uh, we get the readings presented to us based on the eight probes. And then we get the probe orientation, okay? So what do the vendors do with this? Well, what they do is they do what's called an axial strain variation. That's one of the, one of the main things they, they do, which is it identifies longer areas of tensional or compressional trends. And essentially what they do is they take the probe readings, average them, then take out the hoop stress effects, okay? Uh, when I first looked at this, I thought this was absolutely ridiculous. But it actually works, okay, fair enough. Where what we get here, if you look at this thing, is between the goalposts, we've got a 4.2 kilometer long landslide moving perpendicular to a pipeline. And there's overall areas of compressional and tensional trends. And actually that pipe that pulled apart was in this, okay, in a tensional zone of trending. So above the neutral axis, let's say somewhere in here, if you can see my cursor, okay. But what's interesting is you get these people going, well, you know, of course, it's got something to do with the slope of the ground. Well, if you look off to the right, you're going to see a very steep, like for pipeline, that's a 20 degree slope and the ground contour. There's no change in the signature to the left side of the panel where it's almost flat, right? So, sorry, this is just due to imparted strains. Okay, so what I like to put forward is we also got to look at the minimum and maximum strains at any given segment we identify it identifies localized areas of tension compression very well when you look at the e mins and e maxes and it's more of a structural review okay so in this case what you're doing is you can either go through and try to figure out the procedure in Dura et al 2018 which is a curve fitting modeling to determine your e mins or e maxes or I call it the econo version, which will work 99% of the time, is you just take the maximum and minimum of the probe values. Ideally, they should be 180 degrees from each other, but I'll even warn you about that, okay? There's a, there's a fair bit of noise in the data. So let's look at the ASV I previously showed you. And then here is a plot of it versus the E mins and E maxes. The orange lines up and down, I believe, are, in, are integrity digs. And what it'll do, in, in particularly I want to pay attention to tension, is it shows you where you get above a certain uh, SMYS, which is your specified minimum yield stress of your pipelines. As Nikki pointed out though, nowadays they don't tell you what the upper limit is, right? So here's an example of one of these with the E min, E max plotted on a channel versus the topography and the ASV values in blue, okay? And on this slide, oh, look at that. Don't memorize. Exactly nothing is happening, okay? Let's look at this one. There's, of course, something ha happening near a boundary plot, right? Never happens right in the middle of the plot. So that way you get a greater chance of missing it if you're doing it manually, okay? So yeah, so stuff is happening here, okay? It's, it's up above 80% SMYS minimum tension. So it, some alarms go off, okay? That's what it looks like close up. Turns out, this is at a site where the run was done in between two strain reliefs on a pipeline interacting with a parallel moving landslide. And you know what, what's interesting enough, it shows you shows you two uh, or one very important thing that if you think you've strain relieved a pipe, no, you haven't. 
because there's excessive strains in the pipeline in between these two strain release. Okay, I'll just say if there's any regulators on the, uh, we have mitigated this and it never got above a fitness or service limit. Okay, so then let's look at the shapes of these pipes because a lot of people say, oh, that axial strain, it's got a lot of variations in it and it may or may not make sense. Okay, fair enough. So I, this is the raw data for those features. You'll see tensile trends at five o'clock and further down the pipeline at one o'clock, okay? Now let's look at the real data. So this is the IOI IMU showing gross deformations in the pipeline. And then if we look at the overall shape of the pipe, well, the tension's right at the bottom of a sag bend that's been induced by the landslide and right at the top of an overbend being induced by the landslide. It makes sense. And I can tell you from experience that I've looked through a lot of this data. Whenever something's happening, when you drill into the axial strain data, it does make sense. So going forward in the future, what I think we're going to end up, or where we're going to end up with this, is that the axial strain is going to become, I showed you those channels we plotted in the IMU. It's become another data channel and another source of data for our analysis, right? But I'll warn people, right now where we're at, we're at a transition phase in the way we manage geohazards and, uh, you know, continuous improvement, all that good stuff. But we can't be complacent. And the good news is the axial strain tool is evolving rather rapidly right now. One vendor is on the generation two of their tool, and sometime soon they'll likely introduce their generation three, which is not just going to have eight probe readings on it. I, I, I won't get into too much detail. And then we've got at least three pipeline operators that are bringing in similar technologies and are in, let's call it the generation one phase. I know I'm going to get an angry email from someone after this saying, no, 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 it's, but, but, that's my take on it, okay? So, so things are evolving here rapidly. And, I, and I'd say in another 10 to 15 years, this is going to be a routine data source we'll check. So let's try to predict the future now before we go into questions, okay? So we've got geohazard management down, like as far as identifying landslides, databasing them. I'm, I'm, I'm using the BGC Cambio system here as a, an example. We're rapidly figuring out ways to get our MTR data, records, and other things into GIS systems through our pipelines to link with the geohazard management. And then we're also doing that with all of our ILI data, whether it's, whether it's metal loss data, crack tools, and or geohazard stuff, the ILI IMU. Then what's going to happen is on the side, we're doing these brilliant finite element and discrete element analysis of pipe shapes and pipe shape changes based on history. I think when we add in computing power, and if anyone under 30 can tell me who HAL 9000 is in the whatever, we'll give you a shout out. Um, with this computing power, we may be actually running automated machine learning pipeline geohazard interactions by just hitting a button. I'd say that's going to happen in 15 years. Hopefully before after I retire, okay? So with conclusions, I just wanna tell geohazard practitioners and integrity folks that with modern pipe, let's say greater than X70 from 2010 onwards, you gotta be mindful in the parallel loading situation of your zones of tension because now there may be another potential failure scenario in Canada which never existed before. And at the current state of practice, there's no widespread adopted method of measuring said interaction. Okay, now, if you're interested in more in anything I've talked about, like I'm just really, really hitting the tip of the iceberg on these things, you can either, uh, we put on uh, an ILI IMU analysis course, likely be one in IPC in 2024, or a pipeline geotechnique course. And if you're curious about this stuff, um, just pay attention to me on LinkedIn because we publicize this stuff that we're doing here at TSU Geotechnical there. And with that, I'm just going to show this screen for a couple seconds and this screen for a couple seconds because that's all the references that I put into this dumpster fire of the paper, okay? And with that, we can take questions. Okay. So it, this is weird. Nikki and I are sitting here together in the office and we have one headphone between us. So what I'll do there, thank you, Nikki, is I will read question two first. Doug, 
Has there been an odd situation where bending strain has occurred, but there is no obvious change in shape or anomaly? How does ILI help in such detections? What other alternatives may be possibly considered? Wow, okay, that's quite a question. Okay, so first of all, I'll say I get this right. And there's no obvious changes in shape or anomaly. Well, look, we probably don't know about them because, you know, by definition, a bending strain is an anomalous shape or a change in shape. So we wouldn't be able to see those. So let's go here. How does ILI... But, 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 but they might actually have anomalies. Yes. There, there might yeah. Be, there might not be a... So CSCC. Or there might just be a segment or something created from, from that. Yeah. Right? Oh, here. Do you want to talk? You want to... No, no, you can okay. go. Yeah. So there might be... There, there might be... But there'll be changes in shape, right? Yeah. But you might be able to see like a crack feature or something like that on the pipeline. So we take a question. Okay. This is for Nikki. So I'll hand yeah, it over to you. Yeah, sure. So um, one of the questions for me was, what are the benefits and trade-offs of potentially using carbon fiber moving forward instead of steel pipelines? Um, and so <clears throat> that, that's a very loaded question. So um, composite pipelines have a lot of benefit in terms of their ability to have be constructed, pulled inside of potentially additional conduits of, of older pipelines, but However, the, the joining practices of composite pipelines is definitely the, the weakest link of the composite pipeline system. And for reasons that I, I didn't touch in this conversation today, um, their joining practices are much different than, than welding and are very product specific. And so while I think that composite pipelines have a great place in, to be used in our industry, when it comes to understanding uh, landslides and stuff, I would be... Uh, a lot more actually concerned if there was a carbon fiber pipeline in, in a moving landslide than um, than uh, an existing even newer modern grade steel. And just wondering, Susan, if there's any other questions here that uh, are in the chat. Yeah, I can um, I can read out some of the questions. So one of them is, uh, can we get a PDF? So I, I don't know if um, you and, and Doug, if you feel comfortable, we can certainly share a PDF of this of the slides if, if you're both okay with sharing those. Yeah, well, I mean, we're on YouTube right now with all of our glory, so I don't I don't see why a PDF would uh, would cause us trouble. So and then and there's, just, yeah, it's Susan. Before you ask a question, if you just let me know if it's me or Doug, so I can pass the headset over to him. Of course, he's the, okay. star. He's the star of the show. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, so there's another question. It doesn't say what's specified to. It's from Jason asking, could you speak a little bit more to how the IMU, ILI data is rendered and utilized? Question from Jason asking about how the ILI, IMU data is utilized. Okay have about a 160 page document, including a feature library in that. So there's, there's, okay, I'll try to give you the Coles really notes. Like we put a four hour course on and literally just touch on what we do with this. But essentially, when you get ILIIMU data, we get the vendor to do their interpretation of it, where they look at the entire pipeline segment, sending barrel to receiving barrel for the entire pig run. And then they go through and screen for anomalous features and features where it's moving. And then what we do at Pemina here, we have our own proprietary software. Let's say, for instance, we're already concerned about, let's say, river crossing A. There's potential landslides in either side, maybe hydrotechnical issues. Then we actually drill down, take all the geotechnical information with the pipe shape data, all of the anomaly data, and put it all together in what we call a raw data assessment, which is really sort of an engineering assessment of that specifically. And there's various thresholds and criteria for initiating these, which are in a program. And I, I can't really get into that much detail right now. But if you were if to take one of the courses or, or look online, there's some more information on this. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. And um, there's another question. I think this will also be for Doug, and it's from Doug Cook. So regarding the, the first question, we have seen errors in the vendor's analysis being the root cause of reported bending strains. Uh, the vendor did confirm and corrected the data to remove these phantom bending strains. So maybe that's more of a comment. Uh, yeah, well, maybe, maybe I'll expand on that. And a lot of people don't realize this, that 
every vendor has a different criteria for looking at things. There's a lot, like if you look at the feature classification system I've developed, most of your features are what I'll call ILI type, which there's they're either some something with a reaction the pig has or an error in interpreting the data, or you know, there, there's a lot written on this. And it goes to whether you how well you filter out the noise. I mean, it's to the point where some some pipeline uh, or some pigs vibrate through the pipeline. And like if you talk to someone like a Jim Hart, who's the who's one of the lords of interpreting this data. He can actually filter that out based on the frequency of the vibrations and then, then get it back to a real signal. But one thing I will mention, though, is that on the other end is when, when stuff is truly hitting the fan over my 20 years of looking at this data, vendors have only missed stuff twice. And one time, I think that was our fault because we didn't give enough information to the vendor. But once we, we uh, gave them a little more information, they picked up the problem right away. So, so fair enough. Okay. Um, there's more okay. questions coming in now. So one from James, what would be the recommended AGM placements as it is related to slope zones to ensure good XYZ data? Okay, one comment here. And, I, and I, I see that a lot of engineers tend to focus on the exact position of the pipe in space. Okay, if you're doing integrity digs, that's, that's critical because you don't want to be a joint off, right? But we're concerned about the actual shape and changes in shape. So it's not quite as critical, at least for the science I'm involved in, but two kilometers, don't put them in, uh, don't put them in uh, zones where it's moving. And the final thing is, is you only have to do that once. And I think there'll be an upcoming paper at IPC about this that I'm aware of. Okay. okay yeah, Estevan. What is the accuracy and reliability of strain measurements resulting in ILI on U run, especially axial strain? Yeah, it's its own tool. Okay, so is there a point where it's better to move to, to strain gauges? Well, okay, this, this I, I, I caution people first and foremost about the use of strain gauges in an integrity management program. This maybe is another, this could be an entire lecture. And there's a lot of work done recently. Heidi Manneke's put a paper in CGS about this. There's a lot of stuff uh, floating out there in the literature. But we don't really use strain gauges so much. You, we Primarily, we use them during strain relief to make sure that the trends are right in what we're doing. As far as putting them on, now, if we, if we have an integrity dig in an area we know is moving, we certainly install them. But we, we, we don't actively seek out to put them on and install them because the big question is, are you putting them in the right spot and you're relying on them as a fitness or service determination? That's very scary. Okay. Now, now strain measurements, there's a whole bunch of accuracies to the tool. Like I think it's down to 0.02% strain. It's, it's incredibly accurate compared to the thresholds for stuff happening and when you have to react to stuff. But Esteban, if you're curious, I could send you the accuracies offline. Okay. From Henry, are there some recommendations for installing through landslide zone? Uh, oh, putting a pipe through a landslide zone. Well, I mean, the first recommendation is don't drill underneath it. That's, that's number one. Number two, if you're going to, I put them on surface pipeline segments. I mean, you can go back to 1996, uh, McClardian Cavers, which is referenced here, Stewart Creek on the uh, Enbridge line and the Pembina West Coast system or West, Western system. Uh, it's been effectively operated where we just put the pipeline on wooden skids. You change the properties up a bit, you know, uh, you know, so rednecks can't shoot it with a gun and propagate cracks, stuff like that. But there's a fair bit of literature on that. But like the low friction wraps and select backfill, I really haven't used them, and I generally would prefer not to do that. I, I would immediately skid the pipeline up on the ground just to completely avoid the interaction rather than trying to reduce it. Okay, there's one, I don't think we've answered this one yet. So what's the smallest diameter pipelines that you can assess with ILI IMU tools? Three, yeah. three inches. And what happens is, is there is sort of a MEMS-based module that, that goes on the smaller diameter pipelines. Now, I, I don't remember what the transition is. 
And then there's a fiber optic based cruise missile guidance system, which goes, I think it's on eight inch or 12 inch and above, which is slightly more accurate. There's a, there's a really good um, pipeline things on YouTube podcast, all about some of the questions here by uh, Rhett Dobson. It's on YouTube. I, I can, if CGS lets me, I'll put a note in the link about that podcast. I highly recommend everyone listen to it. It's just absolutely fantastic. And just to let you know, Nikki's got to go. Okay. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you again so much. There's lots of thanks coming in to the Q&A from the audience as well. And thanks for all the, the dash and love from, from the audience. But that was an incredibly entertaining presentation from both of you. So yeah, thank you for for um for your talk 